Hi, I'm Martin from Greener Glens, and today we are looking at this little edible fungus down here, the jelly ear or the wood ear. The wood ear is a very common edible bracket fungus that grows from a variety of different woods. It is named for its jelly-like consistency and its resemblance to a human ear, and can be used in various different ways. In this video, I'll show you how to identify it, some interesting facts about it, I'll be preserving some and demonstrating how to turn them into tasty little booze-soaked chocolate treats. A little glug there. So I'm up here dead wooding this lovely big sycamore. I mean, it really is a cracking tree. Have a look at that. And has many dead branches in it that are covered in a particular edible fungus. Now, this is a very common fungus. You may have seen it before, but hopefully, I'm going to give a bit more information about it today. So, it's a dead wood fungus called jelly ear or wood ear. Their scientific name is Auricularia auricula judae. Now, those names are absolutely spot on because it grows on wood and it has a jelly like consistency. It's really rather strange and obviously called an ear because it really does look like a little ear. Now, the great thing about this fungus is it's really easy to identify. You're not going to confuse this with anything else that grows on wood. The jelly-like consistency, the translucent flesh, the colour, which is a sort of browny, whiny colour. And it's got covered in very, very fine hairs that give it a sort of matte appearance. They grow in a cup shape, sometimes quite large. I mean, this one's a, a medium-sized one, but sometimes you can get them up to sort of 25 centimetres across, but more often than not, they max out at around five to 10 centimetres across. They've got a smooth cap, cup shape, which is mostly always facing down, but occasionally you'll see it facing up if perhaps the branch uh, that has been growing on has snapped and then turned over like this, in which case some of the other features will guarantee that it's going to be a woodier. Some other features would include the veiny undulations and subtle ribs that they have mainly visible on the underside. The underside is usually slightly smoother and lighter coloured than the top, with no visible pores to speak of. There are a few other fungal species that are jelly-like and cup-shaped, but the cup is generally facing up and the colour and habitat would be different. It is very unlikely that you will confuse this fungus with another one in Britain. But if you would like to get comfortable with a number of potential confusing species, then I provided a list here to give you an idea of what species to start researching. Feel free to pause this video and read this list and notes attached carefully. There are a lot of jelly fungus out there and of course this list is not exhaustive, so use this as a starting point to do your own research. Now you'll find this pretty much all around the world in any, in any temperate zone and you'll find it pretty much any season. It's more common in autumn and in winter, but you can find it all throughout the year. You'll find it on deadwood, most often on elder, but quite a lot of people wrongly assume that it only grows on elder. That's not true. Uh, this uh, behind me is a great example. It's growing on a sycamore, deadwood here. I've also seen on ash. I've seen it on beach. So here is a nice hazel next to this burn here, and that is a bit of wood ear on dead hazel. So you can see it does indeed grow on a variety of different hardwoods. I've seen it on lime and apparently you can get it all over the world on lots of other different trees eucalyptus for example and there's probably a hundred different things it grows on that i don't know about but those are the ones i've seen on personally now these are edible which is good but i would argue that they are not a choice edible i find them very bland but because they're so common they're really easy to use and it'd be a shame not to use them really and they add a bit of interest because they've got a very interesting consistency. You'll very often find them in Chinese cooking, especially in things like Chinese soups. Now I was once told that the main mushroom ingredient in 
Chinese flavoured or Asian flavoured pot noodles is woody and I'm not sure about that uh, maybe if one of you could confirm that but that's an interesting idea that those of you who eat pot noodles have been eating these and you didn't even realise Also, as always, wild foods usually come with a warning It is fairly well known that wood ears have compounds within them that act as blood thinners so I would recommend not eating too many of them in one go and to those people who are already on blood thinning medication or have other blood clot related issues I would advise them not to consume these mushrooms at all One of the really popular things to do with these is to take them home and to dry them and they dry very easily and they rehydrate very easily You dry them and then you actually soak them and rehydrate them in something a bit more tasty themselves Very often a sweet thing actually which is, sounds, sounds odd but um, what I'm going to do with these ones if I can get them down at the tree without destroying them is soak them in amaretto and then coat them in chocolate to use as a little mushroom dessert Now it sounds weird but I guarantee you it'll work Now they are saprophytic uh, which means they grow on dead wood but they're also weakly parasitic so they will grow on living wood uh, where they cause white rot but it's very very weak uh, fungus um, in terms of you know attacking a, a living tree so it's not really one you need to worry too much about they tend to just digest and get rid of and decompose dead wood that's already dead so as you can probably tell it's winter so uh, i'm getting really rather cold here i'm not moving and hanging in my harness so i'm going to get these out of the tree and take them home and then we'll see what we can do with them in the kitchen Hi everyone, okay so we're back in the kitchen, I've got my jelly ears here, my wood ears, uh, I've got quite a decent little haul, now this is just from the dead wood that I removed from that big sycamore yesterday, and they've just been sitting in a box overnight, I haven't done anything particular to preserve them just yet, so what I've done is I've just given them a little quick rinse because there's lots of sawdust and things on them, didn't really want to bring that into the house as much as a tree surgeon can possibly avoid it, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean them up a little bit before I start processing them a bit further. So I think there's very little point of cleaning them up any further when they've still got little bits of dirt attached to the stipe, you know, which is the piece that's actually emerging, you know, this almost like the root of the fungus or the footing body of the fungus. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to run across a lot of these. I'm just going to remove the stipe, just where it was attached to the tree, because that sometimes envelops bits of tree bark. You know, some of the moss and things that are around the tree, uh, lichens and things like that are on the, on the outside of the tree. And hopefully that should leave us with a reasonably clean jelly ear there. And then very little waste. But what I want to do for my intended recipe for some of the, the better looking and fresher ears is dependent on them being whole and reasonably attractive. Um, so I want to keep the cup shape as much as I can. So I'm trying to remove as little of the fungus as I can so that I've got an attractive piece of fungus left whole. So that's all my jelly ears trimmed up and ready for another little rinse before I put them in a dehydrator. Now again washing mushrooms is always a little bit tricky, some are tough enough that it's okay some just disintegrate so these ones are kind of in the middle there if you rub them too hard under water uh, they are going to split apart and they're going to disintegrate so I'm, only, I'm going to do it very very gently and it doesn't really matter about getting them wet again because I'm going to put them directly into the dehydrator if I was going to dry them like air dry them I might think twice about washing them quite so vigorously because it's going to take an awful lot longer to dry and you might lose some of them to mould and if you're going to air dry them losing things to mould speaking from personal experience is extremely irritating and you don't want to lose any of your hard won well foods through something silly like you know mould so if you're serious about your well foods and you're going to be doing a lot of preserving I really would recommend getting a dehydrator and these Excalibur ones are particularly good you can air dry them of course just like any mushrooms in, inside but in a country like the UK where it's not guaranteed to be roasting hot outside you're going to have to do it inside and you're going to have to do it somewhere where it's fairly warm so they dry faster you don't want a, a cold moist environment inside because that's just going to lead to mould so string them up and hang them up maybe above the stove or near a radiator something like that somewhere with a bit of warm air flow and they'll dry a lot faster so let's give these guys a rinse and then we'll get them in a dehydrator
So there we go. They are all washed and they're looking quite nice now. They've obviously lost their sheen because they're still a little bit damp. And I've just patted them dry inside this tea towel. But it's very obvious how ab absorbent they are when you get them wet. You can see they soak up all the water. And they're going to do the same thing once they're completely dry. They're going to soak up whatever you put them in. Whether that be water just to rehydrate them or directly into a stew, they'll soak up the flavour of the stew as well as giving out a little bit of flavour themselves. But for my purposes right now, I want them completely dry so that all of the moisture is out of them so I can completely replace that moisture with what I rehydrate them in. So these are just going to go straight into the dehydrator. I've got it already set up here. My trays and my drawers are ready to receive them. So I'm going to lay them out thinly. The maximum surface area I might have to remove some of these trees just to get them in because some of them are slightly too tall right now. And these should, again, as with most mushrooms, they'll lose a lot of their mass. They will shrink up really small because most of what makes them up is just water, a bit like us. So that's all my wood ears in. I'm just going to put them into the dehydrator now. I'm going to seal it off and I'm going to turn it to roughly 55 to 60 degrees. You can achieve this in a very low oven, but make sure it's a fan oven and really keep an eye on it the first time you're going to do it because you could end up cooking them or scorching them and that's not really what we're trying to achieve. We're just trying to keep warm air going around them until they slowly dehydrate without cooking. So we'll switch this on and we'll come back when they're dry for the next stage. Okay, that's been about three and a half hours and look at what we've got here. Barely anything about what we put in. You can see most of those jelly ears, just water. So if this cracks, then it's dry. And see, that's dry. And you can see how much they've shrunk. This one here was one of the larger ones. I reckon it was probably the same size as that when it went in. This is another batch I've got ready to go in. So I'm gonna gather these up, I'm gonna put them in an airtight container just now, and then I'm gonna get this other batch in, and once they're dry, we'll then have a look at some of the fun things we're gonna soak them in. So there we go, we have dried our second batch of wood deer, fungi there, and they are looking magic, nice and dry. They dry really easily, these fungi, and they rehydrate really easily, so they're ideal for the purposes I have in mind for them. And they're very easy to collect, I have to say. They're very abundant at this time of year, which is late winter, early spring and you can usually find them in large numbers so it's very easy to collect enough to make this worth it because it's a bit of a faff really. But the beauty of dehydrating them first is that you can choose to do this at any point. I've got a full jar of woodier there so I can choose to rehydrate these whenever I want for whichever purposes I want. I could take some of these out, I could throw them into a stew, some soup, anything where I want a bit of interesting mushroomy flavour and, and sort of texture, I can just chuck them in straight from the jar and the rest of them, as long as they stay, stay inside this airtight container, will last for a long time. We're talking years if they're kept properly. But let's talk about what I'm planning to do with these today. I'm planning on rehydrating them and I'm actually going to cover them in chocolate once they're rehydrated. I'm going to say it again, this is a little bit of a faff and it's not a fungus you're going to depend on if you're out in the wilderness and you're trying to feed yourself from the wild. But it is a very interesting, novel way of using mushrooms to make a, a sweet dessert type treat. So it's an interesting thing to try. And it's great for kids as well if you use a non-alcoholic <laughs> rehydrating medium. But just beside me here, I've got some of my favourite things to use for soaking my woodier fungus in. Now, most of these are available in the shops, but I also have some wild brews and wild liqueurs that I've made previously that make it an even more wildery recipe. And I really like that. 
So one of the flavours that goes really well for it is actually orange. So I've got some orange based liqueurs here. I've got Grand Marnier, which is one of my favourite little digestive type liqueurs. It is an orange based liqueur with cognac. So it's a very interesting flavour and it goes well with the chocolate and the woodiers. Another classic one to soak it in is Amaretto. Again, it's another sweet sort of almondy flavour. So it goes quite well with the woodiers. I'm Scottish, so I love my whiskey, and I particularly love my whiskies from Isla, so I've got some Bunahaban whiskey there, I'm going to soak some in. I've also got some Curaçao here, this is an um, orange flavoured liqueur, you know, triple sec liqueur. That's a much more orangey flavour from the Grand Marnie because it doesn't have the cognac in it. And lastly, the Pièce de Résistance. Uh, this is my Beech Leaf Noyau, now I've got a video on how to make this as well, so check that out on my channel. This liqueur is made by soaking fresh beech leaves in gin and then mixing it with sugar, water and cognac to make a very, very nice springtime brew that is usually ready sometime in the summer and sometimes autumn, but I really like drinking it in the winter. It's really, really tasty. And I'm going to be soaking one of the batches in this as well. So what do we soak them in? Well, you can soak them in anything. You can soak them in a, a, a jar, you can soak them in a bowl. You want to soak them until they're fully rehydrated. So that's probably going to take probably longer than it took to dehydrate them. Because it's late in the day now, I'm probably gonna leave it overnight. Now because these liqueurs and spirits are quite expensive, you're obviously going to want to use as little of them as possible. So, although I usually don't advocate using single-use plastics, these freezer bags are actually very handy for this because you can put your wood ears in these bags, seal them with the liqueur or with your spirit, and you can use a very small amount of spirit because the liquid can move in amongst all the wood ears and your orientation doesn't really matter. You don't have to sit it upright. So all the wood ears are gonna be in an enclosed environment with your liqueur. And obviously you can use the liqueur after you finish, just to drink it straight away. It's perfectly edible, although it will have a slight taste of mushroom. And I must point out that you can also reuse these freezer bags if they're decent quality. Again, I do that all the time and it works great. I just rinse them out, make sure they're nice and clean. I can use them multiple times as long as I take care of them. So obviously the last thing we're gonna need is some chocolate. And I've got some of my favorites here. I've got some milk chocolate from Green and Black, some organic stuff here, and I've got some Orange Intense Lint Chocolate here. And obviously these brands are not sponsoring me because <laughs> these are enormous brands and I'm a tiny little channel. But I just really, really like them. The, the Intense Orange one goes really, really well with the Grand Marnier and the Curacao. And the milk chocolate goes well with the other ones. I'm using milk chocolate here. I sometimes use dark chocolate as well. And the dark chocolate goes quite well with the whiskey, I have to say. I will point out you can use a variety of different things to rehydrate your wood ears in for this recipe. And one of the easiest ones and the ones that's most friendly for people who don't want to use alcohol or you want to make them for children is orange juice. And the wood ears soak that up just as well as any of these orange based spirits. Smells really good. Make sure that they are covered with the amaretto. And I'm going to make sure that they are labelled. But for now, I am going to just put them next to the bottle that I filled it with. Now, on to the Grand Marni. This is one of my favourites, so I'm going to use a few more of these for that. Now, I'll see the, the bigger ones are slightly easier to use with this recipe. But remember, some of these are going to expand a lot once they're rehydrated. So don't underestimate how big they're gonna get because they will increase in size a lot and they return almost to their, if not to their full size once rehydrated. Oh yes, really do like our money. Give that a little glug there. Now obviously I'll be checking these as I'm going to make sure they have got enough liquid and that they're not, they haven't soaked up everything and I've stopped rehydrating. And so these will sit now for a couple of hours and then I'll have a little look at them, see, see how they're doing. If they look like they're getting a bit low, I will top them up a little bit. Remember and give them space to expand. I'm just rolling them up here so that they're sort of in contact with the liqueur. I'm going to keep an eye on them. If they need to be filled up, I will fill them up slightly 
depending on how rehydrated I want them to be, because obviously you can choose to rehydrate them fully or rehydrate them halfway or not. You're gonna want them to be slightly dry when you put the chocolate onto them, so we're gonna dab them dry anyway. There's no benefit of having them absolutely soaking wet with the liqueur. So our wood ears are rehydrated now. They only needed maybe four or five hours, but I just left them in overnight just to make sure. And they're really good, they've absorbed all of the liqueur and all of the spirits, so now they are ready for the next stage. Let's just try one of these. Drum Marnie ones, since they look so good. Smell very good. And it hasn't over absorbed it. It's a little bit surface wet slightly, but we'll dry that off in a minute. Same woody, woodier texture, very interesting. It's glutinous, but it's kind of crunchy as well. It's odd. And the flavour of the Grand Marnie in there. That's nice, that's nice, not too strong, it's nice. So the next stage is to get these dried off slightly so that the chocolate will coat onto them better. So I'm gonna lay them out on some kitchen roll to dry off. And while they're drying off, I'm gonna get my chocolate in some bain -maries. See these ones are a little bit too wet to put the chocolate on. So that's why we're going to leave them out to dry slightly, which means that we over soak them in the liqueur a little bit. And there's still some excess, quite a lot of excess in the bag with them. So the rest of them are kind of okay. So now comes the messy bit. Now we've got our chocolate, it's nicely melted, no lumps. I've got to use this before it starts to solidify again. I think that milk chocolate's already starting to go slightly at the bottom. So I'm going to take the wood ears, I'm going to dip them in the chocolate, I'm then going to attach them onto a bamboo skewer. Now the bamboo skewer needs to be held up above something that's going to capture any of the dripping chocolate that's coming off of it. And I want it to stay in that position until it's dry. So what I came up with is using cardboard boxes. So I'm going to put the wood ears in the chocolate, put them onto bamboo skewers, load up one of these bamboo skewers, and then stab it into the, these, this wall of cardboard box I've got here over these trays, and hopefully that should allow the wood ears to dry and they'll drip into here, I'm not getting too much mess on my nice oak worktop here. So that is the plan. Let's see if this is gonna work. I think there's gonna be a lot of finger licking moments in this. And I'm gonna try and keep track of which ones are which as I put them on there by writing with Sharpie onto the cardboard, which is another benefit of this system. And obviously I've got milk chocolate and orange chocolate for the various different flavors here. I'm gonna put the bottles back in front of the ones that have been flavored with it just to try and keep track of which ones are which so I don't make any mistakes because uh, this is early in the morning and I'm a little bit tired still. Okay, so let's start off with the Bunahaban whiskey ones which are gonna go into the normal milk chocolate. Now obviously if you're only doing, you know, a few of these, you wouldn't need quite this sort of size of setup. You could just hang them over the bowl like I'm doing here, but because I've got quite a number to do, I'm having to set up this rather bizarre drying system. And I will say it's quite important to wait until at least the chocolate is cool enough to handle. And this stuff here is right on the line of that. Okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna over load my skewers too much because they will be obviously fairly heavy. I'm gonna go and stick them into this box this now. There we go, that's obviously quite heavy, so. So that was a gleefully messy process, but they are all done now. They're covered with chocolate, they're drying away nicely there. 
I got more chocolate around than I would have liked, but not too bad. We had one of the cardboard boxes fall over on me, that wasn't great. So I think maybe what I would do next time is I would just dispense with the cardboard boxes and just have numerous trays out, you know, low trays that the bamboo skewers can fit across, much like these ones at the bottom here, and I would do that. And despite my careful lab labelling and marking, I seem to have completely lost the Kurosawa ones. I've no idea which ones they are, but I've, I've managed to group the rest of them nicely so that I know which ones they are so I can bag them up once they're dry. So we will leave them to dry for a while and I can see some of them are already starting to get reasonably dry on the surface. And um, we'll come back and we'll try them once they're dry. So these look great now. They are nice and dry, cooled down, solidified. So I can now bag these up. The chocolate's gonna be very fragile. And if I was gonna keep these for a gift or if I was going to give them to someone or if it wasn't just my own personal consumption I would probably put these into a glass jar or something where they weren't going to get compressed or bashed around but for now I'm happy to put these into the same bags they came out of. So slowly slide them off Oops. into the bag. They smell really good I have to say. Ooh. You gotta make sure you don't do it too roughly or else you end up chocolate ends up coming off them. And this is the whiskey one, so this one's gonna be really good. In fact, I'm gonna have a little try of this one. It's very nice. It's very chewy. I'm gonna to have to warn people if they're gonna try these <laughs> because they look like crispy sweets and you're like, oh, they're gonna crunch or they're just going to fall apart in the mouth, but they don't. As they are still pretty chewy. So it's a slightly strange experience eating them, <laughs> but very tasty. Mm, first bag done. So my intention was to do a taster session with a few friends, but we were having such a good time we finished them all and forgot to film the reactions, but they all said roughly the same thing. A bit weird, but very delicious. I'll be releasing a lot more videos like this in the future, so make sure and like this video, subscribe to Greener Glen's Bushcraft on YouTube, and click the little bell to be notified for future videos. Lots of videos on canoe expeditions, foraging, bushcraft, and woodwork, and all things in between. This is a video about wild food, so it's important to observe safety above all else. There are plants in almost every environment that are toxic to the touch and lethal if ingested. So if you're not sure about the identification of a particular plant or mushroom, just leave it. And get some professional training from a botanist, a mycologist, or a foraging expert so that you can forage with confidence. Even well-known edible species can cause allergic reactions in some people. So always use caution and back up any information that you find with multiple reliable sources. And make sure these sources are based in scientific research and not just anecdotal evidence. It's also important to consider the source of your well foods. There are certain environments that may look clean and green, but they may be possibly near a field that has been sprayed with insecticides or other chemicals. And of course, avoid areas of condensed pollution like sewage outflows, drainage ditches and really, really busy roads. But there are a lot of wild foods out there that are easy to identify and as long as you follow the rules and have an attitude of caution, you can really enjoy your wild foods. Maybe as a sustainable way to feed yourself but also as a way to supplement your diet with tasty things from the hedgerows. Remember a moment of mouth pleasure or impressing your friends is not worth dying for. So please, please be careful and check everything multiple times before you try it. Thanks for watching, I'm Martin from Glens. See you next time.